Now, today, you guys, I told you we're going to be hearing from my friend, Dan Leanne. Dan uh, is, uh, has been a friend of mine for years, uh, coming up through student ministry days. And, and, and now, uh, as a pastor, uh, he, we, we remain friends. Uh, Dan comes to us by way of South Carolina. Uh, he is, uh, he's one of the pastors there at, in, at New Spring, and so he teaches, and he also travels all around uh, and gets to preach the gospel. And so uh, he's, he's also the one of the, the type of friends, you guys, that I can call uh, when I'm having a rough week, when I need to be encouraged, when I need to be challenged. And he's one of those people who, I've said this, he's not impressed with me. And you all need some friends that aren't impressed with you, that will tell you the hard things and the true things uh, in order to make you better. And so, uh, yeah, I'm excited for you guys to get to hear uh, what the Lord has put on Dan's heart. Uh, It's an awesome message. So if you would, give a big Gwinnett Church welcome to my friend Dan Leanne. If anyone loves Jesus, would you put your hands together for him? Come on, let's praise him because he's good. So faithful. Well, hey, how you doing? It's been a little bit of time since I've been here with the Gwinnett family, and some of you all recognize me. Some of you all are looking a little bit confused uh, because the face doesn't match the voice, and the voice doesn't match where Pastor Reed said I was from. So let me introduce myself again. Dan Leanne is my name, and I was born and raised in Melbourne, Australia. That's the reason my voice is this way. Uh, My mother and father are Malaysian Chinese. That's the reason uh, my face is this way. Uh, But nearly eight years ago, my family and I moved to Anderson, South Carolina. That's the reason I have type 2 diabetes. Uh, I drive a truck. I say y'all a lot. I take Clemson football way too seriously. And uh, it's a joy to be able to come and serve the Gwinnett family. I love Pastors Reed and Morgan so, so much. The whole team here are just fantastic, phenomenal, incredible men and women of God leading here, Jesus' church. And, and we gotta give honor where honor is due. So how much we put our hands together and just encourage our leaders. We love them so much. I was talking to Pastor Reed and he said, hey, this Thanksgiving week, just come and share a message that is fresh in your spirit, something that you're grateful for. Uh, maybe just reflect on some lessons that you've learned in 2024. And I didn't have to pray long or think long about a message to bring because I, I have gone through a season this year. My wife and I have gone through a season this year with Jesus that has left us deeply and profoundly encouraged, even though it has been a test. And so that's what I'm gonna do for a couple of minutes this morning, flowing into the afternoon. There's a countdown clock up there. There's a trap door up here. As soon as that thing hits zero, uh, this door's gonna open and I'm going to disappear before your very eyes. And uh, I got told if I stick to time in this service, Pastor Reed is paying for my Korean food. So you gotta understand that that uh, I'm all about Korean food, but especially paid for Korean food. Come on. (laughs) But in our few minutes, I want to talk about a season of waiting that my wife and I have gone through. Has anyone gone through a season of waiting? Just waiting on God. Uh, Waiting can be difficult. Waiting can be discouraging. And if you allow that discouragement to pull in your soul, it'll become destructive to your faith journey. But how many know Jesus didn't come all the way to earth, live a perfect life, die on your behalf, resurrect from a tomb so that your life would be destroyed? He came and did all of that so that you could experience a life overflowing, a life abundant. And that means knowing how to process all the different seasons in our journey, the good, the bad, the highs, the lows. The times you're on top of the mountain singing the hills are alive with the sound of music and also the times where you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And also those seasons where it feels like God has left you waiting, waiting. So that's what we're gonna do for a couple of minutes. We're gonna talk about where Jesus is In this season, you all have all tasted where he is in the waiting. And then in about 33 minutes time, we're gonna have a giant 1115 service hug fest as this is my last away sermon for 2024 in the United States of America. So I wore my white shirt 
to make sure that it gets marked up good and strong with all kinds of mascara and makeup and foundation. I was at a church just up the road a couple of months ago and I came home with a fake eyelash on my shoulder. So I wanna see if I can repeat that in this service. And then after that, I'm gonna receive all suggestions about the best and most expensive Korean food within a 20 mile radius. So that's the flight path for today. Where is Jesus in the waiting? Let me pray and we'll jump into this message. Dear Jesus, we love you. Help us by your spirit. Learn where you are in the waiting. Amen. Confession, I hate waiting. I'm not good at waiting. Now, full disclosure, I'm not the most punctual person in the world. I'm definitely not one of those 15 minutes early is late kind of people, you know what I'm saying? If you're one of those 15 minutes early is late kind of people, could you just lift your hand right now and just out yourself, ma'am, are you one of those people? Well, ma'am, on behalf of all of us, chill out. <laughs> could you just chill, all right? If the meeting's at nine o'clock, I'm a literal person. I'm like a buzzer beater kind of person. You know what I'm saying? 8.59, walking in, three, two, one, shazam, here I am. Don't be looking at me with those judgy eyes. Okay, I know your athletic background or your parents taught you that when you were growing up, but don't put your values on me. Don't be looking at me like I've done something wrong showing up at the agreed time. Now, what we can both agree on is that there are some people in this room right now who are very fluid with their time. They're very flexible with their time and they stress us out. I call them ishy people. You know what I'm saying? Like if a meeting is nine o'clock, it's like nine-ish. If we're catching up for lunch at noon, it's noon-ish. Hey, we're going out for some dinner. Hey, you know what? I'll meet you there at seven-ish. Where, where are those people in this room right now? Would you just out yourself? No shame. You're a very ish. See, there's a, there's a problem here. Because the wife here is a 15 minutes early as late individual. The husband is a very ishy person. Ma'am, I know the feeling. Like, you know, you got dinner plans at seven and all your friends are at the restaurant, but he's still kind of just like mulling around the house, just, just kind of wasting time. And then he starts thinking about getting ready at 7.15. You're getting into the car at 7.30. He decides that, wait a second, I forgot something. He's back in the house at 7.45. Now it's eight o'clock and you're away to, 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 to dinner. And, you, and it's only like three miles up the road, but because we're in Atlanta right now, that can be like an hour drive. And, then you're getting to the restaurant and you're embarrassed because all your friends are already there. You've eaten appetizers in small talk already and he just walks straight in and starts eating everyone's appetizers. I know the feeling. You all stress me out. And in fact, there weren't enough people who out of themselves. So Gwinnett Church is usually a place of no shame, but let's turn this house into a house of shame. Just for the next 10 seconds, I need you to point to the people, come on, in your life who are very ishy and squishy when it comes to their time. Very flexible, very fluid, very, you know what I'm saying? Well, y'all all collectively stress me out. I love you in the name of Jesus, but you stress me out. <laughs> because every time you leave me waiting, you force me to ask questions about you. I either draw the logical conclusion that you would love, sir, to be on time, but you lack the ability to be on time. And that makes me want to get more involved in your life. And because I am busy enough as it is, it stresses me out. Or the other conclusion could be, you could be on time, but you don't care to be on time because you think your time, you, I wish there was a camera on, on this man's wife. Because she's doing this one. Uh-huh. Yeah, yes. You think your time is more important, come on, than my time, all right? Every time someone leaves you waiting, you're forced to ask questions. Have you ever felt like God has left you waiting? Like you know he's made a promise, but it's been a while since the promise was made. You know that God has called you into something new, but that new hasn't come to pass yet. You know that he is God who provides and heals, but your provision is still out of sight. That healing still feels so far away. Has God ever left you waiting? Because if God has left you waiting, it's forced you to ask questions about him. You may not do it publicly. You may not talk about it with your friends, but definitely internally, you have drawn some conclusions about God 
in this season of waiting. Because logically you're asking the question, hey, maybe God can do something, but he doesn't bother to do anything. So he has the ability to move. He has the resource to provide. He has the strength to heal, but for some reason he's withholding. And somehow he can see me going through what I'm going through or we're going through and somehow not be moved by our pain. And if you allow that thought to sit long enough in your soul, you will formulate a picture of God as an apathetic, nonchalant, uncaring God. And that will create a distance between yourself and God because you can truly never be intimate with someone who you feel doesn't care for you as much as you care for them. That's the reason there are some people in this room right now who feel a distance or have felt a distance from God it's been a season of waiting, not properly processed. Or the other logical conclusion could be that God can do something or wants to do something but can't do something. So he would love to be able to get around to your situation. He hears your prayers, but it's gone into the list. And because there's so much stuff going on in the world at any given time, God is overworked and under-resourced, so he can't get to you right now. And if you allow that thought to sit in your head long enough, you'll formulate a picture of a God who's limited. He's good, he's nice, he's strong, he gave us Jesus, but the reality is there's eight billion problems going on in the world at any given time. Everyone's crying out to God and somehow you sit low on the priority list and he'll get to you if he has the time, but he doesn't have the time or the power to deal with your situation in this moment. And again, If you allow that thought to sit in your head or your heart long enough, you'll formalize a picture of God as a limited God, as a small God. And you can never truly pray to a limited God. You can't praise a weak God. That's the reason some of your prayers have been affected. That's the reason you don't pray the same kind of prayers of faith like you used to. It's actually a season of waiting, not properly processed. So you're sitting here in this room right now and you resonate with this idea of going through a season of waiting, but at the same time kind of feel like, you know what? I've thought these things about God at some point. I want you to hear three things. Number one, you're not weird. It is a very logical conclusion for a human being to draw regarding God if you go through a season of waiting. Number two, you're not alone. If I called a timeout right now and got you into small groups to talk about seasons of waiting y'all have gone through, there is no doubt that you'll hear a lot of people telling very similar stories. But number three, and respectfully, but maybe most importantly, I'm here to let you know you're just wrong. That God is not small, he's not weak, he's not apathetic, he's not uncaring. He's closer than you think. And he's up to something good in the midst of the waiting. Have you ever felt like God has left you waiting? In that area of provision, in that area of relationship, in that area of your work, in that area of your health, in that area of just the peace in your heart and your mind as you go through a crazy world, have you ever felt God leave you waiting? Because my wife and I have felt that this year. We've been waiting for green cards because we're trying to stay in America permanently because I have grown attached to this place. Now, don't freak out, I'm here legally, so put your phone away, sir. No, you don't have to like text any hotlines. It's all good right now as we are in this moment. But for the last five years, we have been praying the exact same prayer every single day, knocking on every single door, trying to pull on every single contact to try to see some green cards arrive that'll keep us in this country permanently. In 2019, when we started this process, we got told it should be pretty quick. The kinds of green cards we were going for, we were told were very desirous green cards and it should only take about one year to 18 months unless there are unforeseen circumstances. This is 2019. 
The last five years has been one giant unforeseen circumstance that has left us now in November 2024 with one month technically left on our original visas. So we need something to happen. Do you know what it's like to pray every day about the exact same thing but feel like nothing is moving? Do you know what it's like to pull on a white crocheted sweatshirt and preach on a Sunday morning, stirring other people's faith the whole time, asking the question, hey God, why won't you come through for my family? And just like you've asked questions about God, I've asked questions about God. Just as you felt frustration in your journey, my wife and I have felt frustration in our journey, but I'm just here to testify to you that God speaks in these moments. And he does it through the beautiful presence of the Holy Spirit. He does it through wonderful and deep, profound encouragement that come from brothers and sisters in Christ. But foundationally, he does it through the word of God. And what I wanna do today is I wanna share with you a scripture that has become oxygen to our souls. That has literally been life for our journey, helping us navigate this season of waiting. And all I wanna do is I wanna share what we have learned in this season. And I'm believing that if you've been through or you are going through one of these seasons, these words would be so much more than thoughts on a Sunday morning. It will become the very song of your life as you process through where he is in the waiting. So if you have your Bibles, would you go with me to the book of John chapter 11? John chapter 11. I wanna encourage you throughout the course of this week, if you have more time, to maybe open up the whole of John 11 and do some study. For the sake of time and my desire for free Korean food, I'm gonna jump in and out of this story referring to like eight or nine verses. But I encourage you to maybe spend some time this week just being encouraged by the Word of God and the Spirit of God as you see a season when some of Jesus' friends were left waiting. To give you the context, John chapter 11 follows John chapter 10. That's not very deep or theological. It's just basic arithmetic. But the reason it is important is because at the end of John chapter 10, Jesus' location was identified. And to cut a long story short, he's only a couple of miles from where John chapter 11 is unfolding. A couple of hours walk, he could have got there quick. So let's read John chapter 11, verse one. The Bible says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. So here is Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. As you read through the gospel accounts, you'll see that they owned a house. It was like an Airbnb that Jesus and the disciples would stay at every single time they had business to do in Jerusalem. So they weren't strangers. Lazarus was a close friend. In fact, Mary was the central character of this beautiful episode in Jesus' journey where she shows pure worship through pouring out her best at Jesus' feet. So they weren't strangers, they were friends. They weren't random people Jesus was bumping into on the street receiving a healing. These were people who sat with Jesus in their living room hearing the stories of blind eyes being opened, dead people being raised again, people who did not have the ability to speak, starting to praise God with their own tongue. They had heard the stories themselves. So the request was reasonable. Hey, Jesus, we are friends. We've seen you heal people who you don't even know. You know us. This ain't big for you. You're up the road. Come quick. So the Bible says in verse four, Jesus, in response to this request, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Okay, that sounds like good news. He ain't gonna die. God will be glorified. Jesus will be seen. 
Verse five, the Bible says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. News gets better. I love you. I wanna be there for you. Verse six, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Oh, that was weird. Here's the 911 call. We're desperate right now. We've sent word just in time, but if you delay any minutes, our brother could pass. So what does Jesus do? He sits down for two whole days, 48 excruciating hours. I could have imagined Mary and Martha sitting by their brother's bedside, praying and waiting, but every single tick of the second hand eroding the peace in their soul as they kept looking out the door, waiting for Jesus to show up, but no Jesus. As the story continues, you see that Lazarus actually dies. And then Jesus says, let's go. The disciples are confused, Mary and Martha are confused. And you'll see as John chapter 11 continues, Jesus arrives in in Bethany and Martha is at the gate to meet him. And they have a conversation that I've had with Jesus before. Hey Jesus, where were you? I know you're good, but we would have really been helped by your goodness in that moment. Hey, Hey, we know you're strong, but it feels like you sat on your hands too long. What's fascinating is not only what is said, but what is not said. Jesus doesn't berate her. Jesus doesn't belittle her. Jesus doesn't owe ye of little faith her. Jesus simply listens to her. Then asks the question, hey, where's your sister Mary? Read between the lines. Mary must have been so disappointed in Jesus, the Jesus she loved, she couldn't even look at in that moment. But Jesus says, no, 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 I wanna go see Mary. Bring Mary to me. So Mary shows up and they have a very similar conversation as Martha had with Jesus. Hey Jesus, if you just showed up on time, our brother wouldn't be laying in a tomb right now. Again, Jesus doesn't try to teach a lesson out of this pain. Jesus listens first. Here is a beautiful picture of lamenting. Lamenting is a lost spiritual discipline. It's a lost art in our modern age. We like quick fixes. We like three point messages. We like five step programs. Sometimes in life, things don't work out. Pain is created. You have to take it somewhere. Here's a bonus point for the 1115 service. You're taking your pain and your frustration in this season of waiting somewhere. You're taking it to the fridge, you're taking it to a bottle, you're taking it to a pill, you're taking it to a website, you're taking it out on your spouse, you're taking it somewhere. The only place in this universe that's safe for this pain and this frustration is Jesus himself. His shoulders alone are broad enough to carry the pain you feel in your soul. So take it to him, Mary and Martha did. So the Bible says, Jesus says, hey, I wanna go see Lazarus, take me to Lazarus. So they go down to the local cemetery where Lazarus laid and on the edge of the cemetery, the Bible says everyone is around crying and then the shortest verse in all the Bible is recorded. In verse 35, Jesus wept. God cried. And then Jesus asks Mary and Martha, take me to Lazarus' specific tomb. They must have thought that he wanted to go and pay respects, maybe lay some flowers. But when he got got to the tomb in verse 43, the Bible says, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And then a dead man rose again. But more about that later. I wanna know where Jesus was. No, no, specifically, I wanna know where Jesus is when it feels like we're going through a season of waiting. If you have leather bound journals and pens, I encourage you to take them out right now and start scribbling notes down like this young lady here. Very smart move, very smart move. Because I'm not saying that this is a reality, but we could get to the end 
be facing Jesus and there's an open book twist, book, book test, you know what I'm saying? And I'm messing around, that's not true at all, don't write that down at all. An old mentor of mine used to tell me that a blunt pencil is more effective than a sharp mind in remembering the things God whispers to you about. So I'm just encouraging you, just write some stuff down. If you have an iPhone or an iPad, would you open up the Note app right now and thank the Lord Jesus for Steve Jobs as you do so? That's a wonderful piece of technology you have right there. Where are my Samsung people at? Where are my Google device people at? You can put it away. I've got nothing for you and for your friends <laughs> for the rest of our time together. Because you mess up our group text with your green bubble energy. <laughs> very invasive, very intrusive, very presumptuous. You know what I'm saying? We all like making plans out here. Boop, boop, boop. It's all in blue. And then Shazam, the whole thing is hijacked green because one of your homies got a deal on a Samsung phone at the Verizon at the strip mall. You know what I'm saying? That was you. I'm messing around. You can write some stuff down too. I want to know where Jesus is in the waiting. Because there's a past I journey with so many who feel that way. Waiting for my healing. Waiting for the eradication of that cancer. Waiting to see a, a pregnancy test read positive. Waiting to see a prodigal come home. Waiting to see just some sense of normalcy, come back into society and into the culture that I grew up in, just waiting for God to provide. Where is he in the waiting? Well, point number one, and most importantly, I want you to write this down. He is still on the way. If he's promised it, he'll fulfill it. If he spoke it, it will come to pass. If he's on the way, he is on the way and he will arrive. Come on, just in time. He is on the way. That's the reason in verse four, the Bible says, right at the beginning, Jesus declares, this will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. John chapter 11 is not the story of the time Jesus ran late and left everyone waiting. John chapter 11 tells the story about how Jesus is always on time, every single time, even though his understanding of time is way different than our understanding of time, he's on time. He is on the way. 11.15, can you look to somebody and say, hey, he's on the way. Someone needs to hear that. He is still on the way. I need you to turn to someone else and say, hey, second choice. He is still on the way for you as well. He is still on the way. You would have so much more peace in your journey when you finally reconcile in your heart that your understanding of time is way different than God's understanding of time. To him, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day because he is everywhere all the time at the same time. He is outside of time and space. He sees time differently than the way we see time. So much of your stress and frustration with God is connected to our misunderstanding of the fact that we are not God and we don't control time. Because this is what we do. We, we, we start praying for something we believe God's speaking to us about something and then we set parameters that seem reasonable for God to come through. So you're here and you're waiting for God to speak to you about a brand new season to open up in your job and you've dedicated to one month of praying, maybe even some fasting, not like crazy fasting, but like kind of Daniel fasting and you're there, I'm going to like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna press into God and I'm gonna give him one month to move but after a month, nothing happens. So you assume that God has forgotten, but what was the problem? You're the one who set the time parameters. And because God doesn't stick to your time, He somehow left you waiting. Again, can I just take a lot of stress out of your soul and remind you that He's God and you're not, and His understanding of time is different than your understanding of time, but He is right on time every time. Come on. He is in control and on the way. He is still on the way. And what makes it especially hard is that even though humanity has had a proclivity all the way through its story to think that we are somehow in control of time, our generation struggles with that more than ever. Because of technology, because of our smartphones and devices to control life, even the way that we consume material. Think about how we used to watch TV back in the day. Remember, who remembers TV shows you have to wait like, an every, like a week to go watch it again? You know what I'm saying? A week. 
Yeah, the lady over, you got no idea, you're like a Gen Z, you got no idea about those times. Let me explain to you, okay, back in the day, there were things called TV shows, all right? And you'd have to watch a TV show like once a week. And at the end of the week, like the episode, you have to get, get I'm just going to blow your mind, you have to wait a whole other week until you get to see it again, yes. So growing up, growing up in Australia, there was a show called The A-Team, which is what we basically got all of our view of America from. We thought America was a giant country with a bunch of veterans driving around in a truck jumping stuff, okay? Now this is gonna really blow your mind. So what we'd have to do is we'd sit down at 8 p.m. on a Wednesday night after dinner, dad would get to sit in the seat, we'd sit on the ground, and, and ba, 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 we'd watch the A-Team. And even though sometimes the episode would finish with B.A. Baracus jumping this truck, okay, and there'd be a to be continued, we, we had no other option, get your mind around this, but to wait an entire week. Not anymore for young people like this, now you can just like binge it all on Netflix. You know what I'm saying? You can go later and like just Google where is A-Team on streaming services and you can just watch episode after episode. I'm, I bet that even at the end of an episode when it comes up, next episode starts in five, four, three. You can't even wait for it to get to the one. You just hit that little thing. <laughs> we all think we control time more than we do. Let me take a lot of stress out of your soul. Let me cut a lot of frustration out of your life. He's God and we are so not. But his time is right on time. Come on, every single time. And God will get glory and Jesus will be seen. If he's promised it, it'll come to pass. If he's spoken it, it cannot be stopped. He's on time every single time. Point number two, I want you to write this one down. Not only is he still on the way, as you're waiting and maybe getting a little frustrated, he doesn't get angry, he doesn't belittle, he is present in your pain. He's present in your pain. He's connected to what you're feeling. He knows that you're annoyed. That's the reason you'll see there, in verse 35, again, the shortest verse in all of the Bible, maybe, maybe it happens so you can remember exactly where he is when you are in the midst of your deepest pain. Jesus wept. God cried. In my years of doing ministry, I've been doing this for nearly 30 years. I know I don't look old enough to have done this for 30 years but they say that black doesn't crack or Asian don't raisin, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, <laughs> Asian good. Probably the most common question I've been asked is about where God is in the suffering. Does he see me going through what I'm going through? Does he recognize the pain that I'm feeling? Not only does he see it, he's so present He's there participating with you in the midst of what you're going through. Because I conclude that he cried, not because he was overwhelmed, because he is Jesus Christ, the firstborn over all creation, through whom everything was made, for whom everything was made, in whom everything is held together. He's literally got the whole world in his hands. He wasn't overwhelmed or out of control. He didn't cry because he missed Lazarus. He knew that he was gonna raise him from the dead in two minutes. The only logical conclusion regarding why Jesus cried was that he was with a bunch of people who were crying too. And that's in line with his character because he is Yahweh, the great I am. Not I used to be good in the back, of the back in the day. I may be good for you, maybe, maybe not. No, he is right here, right now, intricately intertwined with every fiber of your story. Not only does Jesus see you cry, we have a picture here for all posterity of the time where God cried with you too. You may have asked this question at some point in your journey, does he see me cry? God cries too. He's a sympathetic crier. I'm a sympathetic crier. I don't cry in movies, but if you start crying, watch out. I cried in the Barbie movie. I didn't understand the Barbie movie. Not one part of it. 
but I was with my wife and my daughter and they started crying, so I started crying too. <laughs> I tried to not cry. I did this one. <laughs> Didn't help. I did this one. <laughs> Made it worse. You don't have a high priest who doesn't know what it's like to go through a season where you ask a few questions. But you have one who has been through every kind of up and down that you all have tasted. Jesus wept too. Where is he in the waiting? He's still on the way. He's present in your pain. And thirdly and lastly, I want you to know that he gets the final say. Over your season, over your story, over the stretch of time, I promise you, he gets the final say. The alpha, the omega, the first word and the last, he gets the final say. That's why you see there in verse 43, I love it. Jesus like, okay, I wanna see where Lazarus specifically lays. I wanna see his tomb. I could have imagined Mary and Martha going, maybe he wants to say a prayer or lay some flowers down. And so they take Jesus to Lazarus's fresh tomb. And the Bible says in verse 43, when he gets to that tomb, he calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Now you know why he had to specify Lazarus. Because so final are the words of Jesus If he walked into a cemetery and just yelled out at the top of his voice, get out, every dead thing would have risen again and started walking around. That's some zombie apocalypse stuff. That's some, does anyone remember the Michael Jackson thriller video from the 80s? That would have all unfolded. So final are the words of Jesus. Death doesn't get the final say. Disappointment doesn't get the final say. Divorce doesn't get the final say. Bankruptcy doesn't get the final say. Betrayal doesn't get the final say. Cancer doesn't get the final say. Jesus always gets the final say. And if God hasn't been glorified and Jesus hasn't been revealed, I can guarantee you He's still on the way. He's present in the midst of your pain and He's getting ready, come on, to get the final say. If you're grateful for that, just praise Him in the room a little bit here at 15. He gets the final say. I don't know where I'm gonna end up. I hope we get to stay in America because we like this place. I like Bojangles. Do you have Bojangles down here in Atlanta? I like Bojangles. I like chickeny biscuits for breakfast. Who would have thunk it? North Carolina thought it. South Carolina adopted it. Apparently it's come down here to Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? Like, I like, I want to stay here. This 12-team college football playoff thing sounds interesting to me. I want to see how it all shakes out. Hey, George, you got some help last night. You know what I'm saying? You got some help, big help. Your prayers are not being listened to. Just get over it. (laughs) You've had enough in the last couple of years. Just share it around again. But if we end up in Australia, like, you know what I'm saying? The whole country is surrounded by beach. Everyone's friendly. If I get deported to China, I'm not gonna be happy because I'm not even from China, but like, you know, like wherever I end up, I 100% know that God will be glorified, Jesus will be seen. What He said will happen will come to pass. He gets the final say He's present no matter what we feel. And He will get the final. He will get the final. He will get the final. I know that some people here in this room resonate with what we talked about here this afternoon. And my heart's hope and my heart's simple prayer is this. That the thoughts that bounced around your head and your heart for the last 37 minutes 
would literally become foundational faith statements that resonate deep in your soul as you walk through this season of waiting. So as we wrap up our time, I just wanna do one simple thing. I like to knit faith with a brother or sister here in this room who has been through or is going through this very season. Because there are some people who over the last 37 and a half minutes, you've been thinking to yourself, wow, it's like God is really speaking to me this morning. I felt this and I know this. I wanna knit faith with you and believe that God is gonna give you grace to take this stuff that you hear and walk it out with total and absolute confidence knowing that He is still on the way, present in your pain, and He will get the final say. So with every eye open and every head raised and everyone looking around in a judgmental manner, I do that because the Bible says God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. And I found in my journey that He is not only a promise maker, but a promise keeper. I just wanna activate a promise for your life before you leave the doors today. I'm believing for grace to be felt in your journey as you walk forward and this stuff that you hear will become the very foundation that you stand on. I'm believing for joy to come back into your journey, for thanksgiving to flow back into your speech for expectation to start framing your imagination once again as you remember that He's still on the way, present in your pain, and He gets the final say. So if that word was for you this morning, would you allow your brother, Uncle Dan, to knit faith with you and believe for this truth to become foundational in your walk through this season? So with every eye open, every head raised, if that word was for you today, would you lift your hand high in the sky right now? High in the sky. Wow, see, you're not alone. Keep it lifted high. It's early in the day, your deodorant will hold. (laughs) In the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for the chance to get together and experience your presence. We thank you for the laughter in the room, the lightness we feel, the hope that we sense. And I thank you, God, that you spoke to us today. Take the words you have whispered and shape them into faith declarations that we will boom with our lives this week. And we thank you. You're still, still, still on the way. You haven't forgotten us. You're present in our emotion and pain. And we thank you, God. You always get the final... In Jesus' name, amen.